of React Native applications. But before we get started, I want to walk through the checklist for a great talk. As much as it is about me delivering a lot of value in terms of my presentation, there's also a checklist for all of you to follow. Uh, so, one thing I would say is like, please not yes. Please not yes if you agree with me, but even if you disagree with me, please not yes. That's it. <laughs> if you have any questions, please come find me after because I don't believe we are doing any Q&A after. And overall, I want more energy in the room. I know it is day two. I know y'all just had coffee. I did not have coffee, which is honestly a crime before my presentation. But anyway, I want more energy in the room. So anytime I want like a woohoo, you know, so yeah. Can I get a woohoo? Okay, there you go. Perfect. So, all right, so raise your hand. How many of you still believe that React Native is slower than just native app development? All right, we have a few hands and totally valid concerns, by the way. And how many of you want to say it depends to the previous question? I guess we have a, quite a few senior developers here because we love to say it depends. Well, in this talk, we will really talk about the, some of the performance myths of React Native applications and even some hesitations that we have overall in terms of scaling some of the apps as well. So we'll talk about some of the best practices as well. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Ankita. I, um, I'm currently an online educator. Previously, I have been in senior leadership. I, I was a developer for many years, and recently, I also switched to being a YouTuber as well. So these are all my handles. You can notice that Twitter has a nine after, which I'm trying to get rid of uh, for a while. But yeah, my goal is to help you level up in your engineering career and use all my experience that I've learned over a decade um, and yeah, share more YouTube videos and create online courses and whatnot. So yeah, please like and subscribe my channel, as YouTubers would say. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm bad at this. But yeah, that's my Twitter handle as well, if you want. And if you want all the slides and all the code snippets that I have shared, you can also head over to this specific link as well. And it's literally Chain React 23, which I cannot believe how I got the link for. And this is also my weekly newsletter. I share a weekly snack size newsletter uh, where you know, I share performance tips. You know, in less than five minutes, you'll learn something new every week. So if you are interested, you can go to that link. Uh, it's just my website slash newsletter. All right, so before we get started, I kind of want to talk about you know, how React Native works and sort of go through the basics of it, right? Now, your JavaScript code is executed on the left-hand side then React Native passes some information through this magical bridge that we see, right? And notice the unicorn there. Um, and native things are then executed on the native thread. <coughs> now, there might be certain cases where JavaScript can only do so much, but what's important is that we do right for our users and pick the best solution for the problem that they're facing. So some of the things that we will talk about, I think performance is a huge one, especially in the native app world. So I also want to share a quick story uh, as well. A few years ago, a couple of friends and I, we were just having drinks, uh, grabbing drinks, and just chatting about life. And also, you know, we were all developers, so we were also talking about React Native, obviously. Um, and as we were talking about React Native, we wanted to port over a e-commerce application at the time to uh, just mo mobile development. So we were kind of discussing and discussing the pros and cons of doing both. Now, at the time, they did not have any React Native experience, so they had a lot of reservations about it. And some of them that we will talk about uh, right after this, but performance was a huge concern for a lot of them. And it, honestly, it's like totally valid because even when I switched to React Native, after doing native development purely in Android and iOS Swift all the way to React Native, <coughs> I also had the same reservation and I was trying to draw comparisons between the two. But here are a few concerns that they had, right? One is they were just like, JavaScript is just not enough, which I'm not sure I agree, but we will talk about that. 
you cannot animate correctly, and there are also performance issues in general, such as high CPU, navigation, and all the things that we will cover in our presentation today. So let's use this story and let's use my friends as a way to kind of you know, discuss about performance in general and some of the reservations that they had initially. So let's address these, but also some more on top of that. So what we're going to do is let's build an app together, right? Now, this is a requirements of the app. Now, we will call this app, let's spend your money, because I love spending my money, or maybe your money, I don't know. Uh, but based on how much money you have left, it will put you in either red, yellow, or green. But we also have a few things that we need to keep in mind, right? A few criteria in general. One is that our app needs to be functional, it should be fast to load, has really cool animations, so we definitely care about performance. And lastly, it should also work on like low data. So even if your battery is low or anything like that, or even if you don't have the fastest internet possible, then it should work as well. But based on how much money you have, this app is also going to generate a list of insights. So for example, go to Paris, spa treatment, get a private jet, and so on. So this is also a real app that honestly I've architected in the past as well. And if you think about it, a lot of applications in general would have some sort of animations. We wanna show some sort of chart or some sort. We have a list of items that we wanna render. And the, by clicking on every each item, we wanna navigate to the next one. Honestly, that is like majority of the React Native applications that I've seen because we, we, we basically do the same thing over and over. You also get the user to log in and so on. But there are applications that we will talk about later where JavaScript may not, may not be enough. And, but this is an application that we will take a look at because this is a very common use case. So what is our criteria for measuring performance, right? We want to measure a very specific behavior. You want to always average your measurements over several iterations. You always want to have the same conditions for measuring performance and for every measure. For example, duration of the measure, first launch, boot time, network, uh, what kind of network do you have, and so on. And lastly, you also want to automate the behavior, but we won't talk about that right now. So you want to think about, you know, the, this is a cr basic criteria for measuring performance in general. So anytime you want to measure performance, you want to measure a specific behavior. Keep the set, same test set uh, of test cases, and also make sure that you are in production mode and not in development mode. Because in development mode, you do have a lot going on, which won't be fair for the performance of your application. Yeah, you, you will feel your app is much slower than it actually is. So three important criteria on top of that would be, at any time you wanna make an app performant, you wanna think about CPU and memory, right? Application size, app startup time, and frames per second. So for CPU and memory, less CPU consumption means more battery life. And this is really crucial for mobile devices in general. Application size, you want to fast download the app and you also want your phone to consume less memory from that specific app because you want to make sure that that app is available to potential customers. And app startup time and frames per second. Now users will start to see a lag uh, if it's under 60 uh, frames per second. So you really want to make sure that it has to run at 60 FPS, otherwise it's going to be really slow. And again, app startup time as well. Now, how many times have we opened an app? And honestly, I just delete the app if it's really, really slow, because I start to worry that it's going to slow down my phone overall. So this, these are really important cr criteria to think about when you're starting your performance. And you can approach this in two ways. And there are more ways that we will talk about. One is the React Native specific way. We want to use specific React Native elements. We want to do network inspection just to monitor what's the, you know, what's the load of the app, boot time, and so on. But on the other hand, there's also the React way, which is like measuring re-renders and removing console logs and so on. And oftentimes, it's, it's, I would say like a lot of performance issues have come from re-renders more than usual because we don't necessarily test up the app performance as much because we focus too much on you know, the bundle size and so on. So we'll talk about that. The first thing for our specific app, right? Now, these are not just the three items that we are loading, that we are, that we are seeing on the screen. There are a lot more that we are using, right? And we're showing that to the user. So you wanna load only the items that are needed 
So you, the, your first instinct might be that you are going to probably use scroll view because you want to scroll through the list of items. And that is something that you should avoid at all costs because it scroll view, unless it, you only have like, you know, maybe three items, then it makes sense. But if you have too many items, then you want to avoid scroll view to begin with because it will render all the items at once. And if you have, you know, a ton of items, then it's going to be very difficult because your app will start to get really slow. So in that case, to only load the items that are truly needed for your app, and as the user scrolls down, more items get visible. You want to use something like flat list or section list instead of scroll view because it's only going to render the items as seen on the page. Most of them are like lazy loaded, right? As you scroll down, more items will get loaded in general. And again, like we have, since we have a lot of insights, you want to keep this in mind and you can think about it. This is like, a very common use case because we have a we all have like a list of items that we want to show so you want to keep that in mind in general and again as you scroll the, through the items it will the items will re-render and this is a common issue that i have seen with flat list in general that you really need to be careful of as well so something that you need to keep in mind is that as flat list on its own is really great you can it will only render the items that you see on the page. But as more items get re-rendered, you also want to think about performance on top of flat list as well. So what kind of items are you re-rendering and what kind of items do you want to show in this case? So as you scroll, you will notice that the items also re-render over and over again. So what is something that we need to do for that, right? And that's where we, memoization comes in. Now, memoization essentially means that you want to cache whatever components possible, whenever the component is pure. You don't need to re-render unless the specific props change, right? And that's something that you need to really keep in mind. So for that, you can wrap the component in memo. And by memoizing a component and by wrapping it you know, in react.memo, we are saying that, hey, we only want, this component is probably pure, and we only need to re-render unless the props change. So something that is, something that you should follow in general. And you also don't wanna to try to fix what's not broken. So you don't need to wrap every single component in memo because that's a performance trick that we probably learned here, right? Because you need to keep this in mind that not everything needs to be memoized as well. So should you use, let's say, you know, there are hooks available, like use memo, use callback, react.memo, in general, everywhere. Well, let's look at how memo works and then we will talk about that, right? So now in this case, you will see that there is a dependencies array. Now anytime, but whenever we add a specific prop or a dependency, the specific you know, list is going to, the specific function or a list or a component is going to re-render uh, anytime. So what you need to do is you need to be mindful of how many components that you want to wrap in memo because anytime you want to add a specific uh, dependency there, you need to think of it as a, uh, do you want to purge the cache or not? So, and the reason why you want to think that way is because the calculation of props is more costly than the entire component re-render. Now, if we look at memo, what it's going to do is it's going to look at the prop, it's going to look at the previous state, and it's going to compare. Should I re-render or should I not, right? And based on that, it is then going to re-render or not. Now, imagine you have a really huge component and it does a lot of things. In that case, you need to be really mindful that should the calculation of props be, is better, should we wrap it in memo or use callback or any sort of memoization technique or you let the component re-render because that is actually faster in our case because it's going to do the computation every single time. So in a complex component like card, you can, you can think of how many properties in general that the specific component might have, right? Now, there are different, for example, in this case, there are different lipstick colors, there's a brand name, there are, there's item price, there are images being loaded, and so on. Now this component is starting to get really, really huge. In that case, you wanna start calculating if it's worth it, it's, if it's expensive to just wrap it in memoization, and accordingly test it out just to make sure that it's actually performant and it's actually beneficial for your app. 
So you could use console.time or even the performance monitor that you get as well uh, out of the box from React Native to monitor the performance of the specific component. Start measuring and start making it part of your practice in your dev cycle because it's going to be really, really important. And a lot of times I find that it, when it's too late, when performance becomes a bottleneck, that's when we start looking at all these different components, which is fair in a way because you know React out of the box is really performant and it does a lot of performance optimization techniques, but having an awareness of these and making it part of your feature development is very crucial as well. And you also wanna remove any sort of unnecessary console logs as well. Now, you, you might be used to using a, a library, a logging library such as Redux Logger or any sort of logging libraries. Now you wanna make sure that you remove any sort of console logs that ship into the bundle size. And for that, you could use a plugin for this and you can add this specific um, line, line four in, in the specific Babel RC file. And this will remove any sort of unnecessary console logs that get added to the bundle. And again, you wanna make sure that you don't wanna log every single thing, but also wanna make sure that you wanna log the things that you really care about. Now the next thing in our app, going back to it, now we know how to render the list of items using flat list. We are going to avoid scroll view. Now what about the animations in general? This is something, it's an important criteria for an app that we discussed initially. So what do we do about that? Well, this is the other thing that my friends talked about and a lot of times I hear from clients that I've worked with in the past that it cannot handle complex animations. And again, this is something that we would look at right now because again, if you are mindful of what kind of animations that you're using and what sort of preferences and user requirements you may have, then actually they are performant. So again, users will start to notice a lag if you start dropping under 60 frames per second for animations because your experience will start to feel really, really choppy. Now, it turns out creating smooth animations by just being in you know, the, J the JavaScript land can be quite challenging. And you do get an animated library out of the box that does do a lot, but it is a really hard challenge in general when you start implementing animations. But there are a few things you can do. Now, there is a library called Reanimated. They did a rewrite, I think it's V3 right now. And what they do is they think of performance from the get-go. You do need to think, you need to write your animated code in a bit different way compared to the usual React Native way. But this library is pretty good and performant out of the box that you can start using to build your animations. The other library is Lottie. If you have heard of it, it basically takes a JSON object you can animate outside and then export it as a JSON, which makes it really performant and gets rendered natively as well because animations get rendered as, as JSON. And overall, you need to think twice before picking a library. A lot of times we get really <coughs> excited that we just don't have time or you know, we have a really huge feature to build and you need to be mindful of which library that you add in your specific app. And that does create a bottleneck eventually. So for example, if you, if, if you make the app bundle huge, then it's going to create a problem with your performance. So also make sure that the library that you use is actually performant or not. Second, you, do you even need that library? A lot of times you install a library, but it only adds a few lines of code in general. You really need to be mindful of that because can you just write the code yourself or do you really need a library for that? So again, make sure that you also, it has support for Android and iOS as well as you start building those libraries and turning off specific features in a platform if that library, if that library is really essential for you. And again, you wanna like turn off animations in general whenever you have like low memory or you know, when, it's, when, our, when your phone is in low data mode and reanimated library has a property for that as well that you can think of. Again, this was a criteria in our application and by thinking of performance from the get-go and not as an afterthought, we can think of adding all these little increments along the way and performance doesn't become like an afterthought eventually. And the other myth that I have heard a lot is testing application performance on iPhone is enough. Now, unfortunately, it's not enough. In fact, 
Android versus iOS in the React Native world, there's a huge debate about it. I know that we have a lot of pains with Android in general. And because of that, we default to using iPhone all the time, but it does create problems when you start you know, testing your app for performance, because in the world, there are more, uh, I think 75% of devices use Android. So this is an important metric that you want to consider. And recently, this number did drop a little bit, which is like, I think, 72% now. But Android has a bigger share in the market that you need to be mindful of. So when you start testing your app performance, you need to start testing it on an Android device as well. As much as we love iOS, uh, Android is very important. And in fact, a lot of performance issues are something that are easily caught on Android. And when we start shipping to users, you want to be mindful that, you know, which market are you targeting? Are you targeting in the States or are you targeting all across the world? And all across the world, Android is really common compared to iOS. Something that you need to really keep in mind and start looking into the logs and seeing, you know, which country or which country you want to target and which devices do they use and use that specific, as a com use that specific common device as your test plan. And again, not everyone has a high-end iPhone, and Samsung is way more popular compared to iPhones in general all across the world. So you want to make sure that you're actually testing performance on lower-end devices. Now, again, even if you pick Android, don't go for a Pixel, I don't know, is it at 3XL now? I don't know where, what Pixel version is, but don't use the latest Pixel. Actually use a lower end device, even in Android, just to make sure that you are able to test true performance. Because if your app is performant in a device like that, it is more likely going to be very fast, in a, in a, for example, in an iPhone or a Pixel and so on. And you can use tools such as Flipper, Xcode, and React Profiler and you want to make sure that, you know, there are things that you need to keep in mind, right? For example, does the app take too long to open? What is the time for the app closing, right? If navigation takes too long, what about form typing? Does it take too long to change the value and so on? These are all things that you can check in Xcode, React Profiler, and as well as Flipper, so start testing the performance there as well. Again, little increments along the way in your feature development cycle will really help you out. And this is a React Profiler um, screenshot. You need to check the record which why each component rendered while profiling, because that is really important. It will actually flash the component that when it's profiling it. <clears throat> and you want to uh, highlight updates when component re-render. And actually, this is the one that will flash it, and the previous one will actually record the component and will show you how long does it take to re-render in that case. Now, this is a screenshot after I memoized the flat list items. And now you can see that in this specific screenshot, the flat list is memoized. It doesn't have any colors on it, and it does not re-render to begin with. And it will also tell you, which I should have probably taken a screenshot of, but it will also tell you how much time it takes to re-render in general, so you can start monitoring your components like that. I think yesterday there was a talk about this as well, where uh, the, the video app specifically also looked at, you know, the frames per second, but also the React profiler just to test out how much time does the component re-render. And you also want to use maybe an interaction manager to schedule your tasks as well. Now, this is a very, this was a very common practice when I was doing Android development in general, but to actually schedule the tasks or run them in the background and not necessarily in the foreground and things like that. Now, when you think of performance, think of the tasks that you don't need them to run uh, in the foreground. Think, think of them, uh, think of tasks that need to run in the background. And you can start running using Interaction Manager to schedule these tasks in advance. You can start testing, and we did this in an app where users were probably not awake at a specific period of time. That's when we started scheduling those tasks so that the specific task does get performed as the users start to use the app in general. So when should you go native versus React native? Now, we talked a lot about performance overall throughout this presentation, but when should you truly go native over React Native? I think that React Native is pretty sufficient 
overall out of the box, making sure that you are still performing all the performance uh, techniques and applying all the performance techniques that we talked about. But there are certain cases where you will benefit going native. And there was an app that I worked on that was really important where performance did matter. Now this was the app where, for example, as you take a camera uh, and as you basically use the camera module, you, you, set, you take a screenshot, or you take a photo of the specific strip, you monitor the specific strip, and then you, you send it back to the camera or to your specific app. Now, if you don't measure it correctly, then you also wanna send messages back and forth. So going back to the previous diagram of bridging, right? We are bridging a lot here. We are sending data back and forth and you start to see that the application gets really, really slow. And th this is for monitoring glucose levels in general. So it was very important. It was a very important app that we were, were able to measure and monitor the glucose level. And anytime the user did not scan the photo right, then you had to rescan it and show them an error and take the photo again. Now this is, for this specific app, we started to see a lag in the camera module in general because we are using the phone's hardware directly and JavaScript was just not enough and it was really slow. And that's when we decided to bridge it and use the native code just to make sure that we are seeing the performance benefits uh, and using the camera hardware directly. So if you, unless you really need it, you don't necessarily need to go pure native development or actually up, go approach a hybrid model in general. So this is, a, this is a case where you might wanna go native. So what are some performance tips you know, before we end this presentation? Well, you wanna make sure that you're testing on every device and network and also testing when you don't have high-speed internet because that doesn't represent all of our users. A lot of times when you start testing our devices, we are you know, on our high-speed Wi-Fi, start testing on low, low speed Wi-Fi as well. And you wanna focus on low end devices, you wanna test on slower networks and throttle, and you also wanna profile your app in production mode, not just development mode. And this is a recent stat that I grabbed from Oberlo, which is, which is essentially Samsung shipped 243 million unit sales in 2022. So you wanna make sure that Samsung is a very popular device that has been used all across the world. And you wanna make sure that you use Samsung to test out uh, your app performance. And just to end my, you know, my story that I shared initially as well, my friends were really more convinced than they initially were as we started talking about the performance benefits of React Native apps, what can we do and alternatives as we discussed the pros and cons and had a pretty good conversation about it. Now we decided later on to essentially spike a lot of our tasks and test out you know, what is something that we can do, take specific features and build them in React Native just to see how, you know, how our development process is overall. And that's basically the end of the story over there. And I also am working on a free React Native mini course that focus on all the ignored parts of React Native. For example, like performance being an afterthought and so on. So if you're interested, you can go to bit.ly slash rnbest. Again, I'm not sure how am I getting all these links which are so easy with bit.ly. Uh, but yeah, this is a free mini course, so check it out if you're interested or come find me after if you wanna know more. And again, lastly, I wanna leave this specific presentation with is make sure that you make performance part of your practice in user stories and testings. Don't wait for performance to be a bottleneck, right? Just like how we think about accessibility, we don't wanna think of accessibility as an afterthought. As some of the other speakers have mentioned, we also don't wanna make sure, we also wanna make sure that performance doesn't become an afterthought as well, and it becomes part of your user stories. I kind of think of like you can start using it after feature, every feature, or as you start building these stories and putting up Per request, you can start giving feedback to each other and think of performance from the get-go. And again, native versus React native discussion, you wanna pick the best tool for your users. It doesn't matter which tool you end up going with, but it, what matters is that you are doing right for your users and making sure that the library that you use or the tool that you use in general is actually really performant and is doing good for your users. Having said that, thank you so much for listening.
and all my slides are at this link.